Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So I-V-D-I, International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash inv, and we'll get you the information that you need. So let's uh, let's talk about um, extraction uh, determination. Pocket depth is primarily soft tissue, and so we would never um, extract a tooth if we just have um, soft tissue changes. Um, typically, if we have very deep pockets, they're going to be there's going to be bone loss associated with that as well. So we want to make sure that we're evaluating the x-rays and looking for bone loss. That tells us um, whether a tooth should be extracted or not. And there's guidelines, 50% uh, or more bone loss, that's an automatic extraction. There are those teeth that are on the fence that can have a very deep pocket, um, but has minimal bone loss. Um, so we have to kind of look at that and see, and, and in particularly those, um, those canines, um, the maxillary canines, can be tricky because on x-ray sometimes we won't see and we won't appreciate uh, the palatal bone uh, loss. But if we uh, probe that pocket and we find that you know we're going into the nasal cavity or that pocket is nine or 10 or 12 millimeters and you know we, that tells us we've got significant bone loss on that side because that pocket's not gonna be that deep without significant bone loss. So those um, those determinations are um, extractions as well. But we always base decisions on gross pathology as well as um, uh, radiographic pathology. All right, if a puppy comes in for a dental due to malocclusion and the other teeth have no tartar, do you scale and polish? No. Um, I'm not going to put a scaler on a tooth uh, that does not have any um, plaque or tartar. I'm going to polish, so if there's plaque that we can't see that's maybe just starting to form, I'm certainly going to polish, but I don't want to etch that tooth um, if we don't need to. So we're, we're going to kind of use our best judgment and um, uh, polish only if needed. Uh, do you recommend convenient injections um, or intra-op and post-op antibiotics or only in cases where significant periodontal disease? Antibiotics, uh, again, a um, lot of questions um, regarding antibiotics, and antibiotics tend to be way overused. Um, when I was in general practice years and years and years ago, for some reason we would dispense antibiotics for every single patient that had a dental, even if it was just dental cleaning, and that is um, inappropriate. Antibiotics are used in, um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, yes, if we have advanced periodontal disease where we're seeing, you know, um, pus, where we're having that tremendous odor, you know, where it just knocks you over, that's active infection going on. And so we're going to do intra-op IV antibiotics, typically ampicillin. And then all of that infected tissue and bone is being debrided. So that's going to get out of there. And if there's any lingering bacteria, the immune system is going to take care of it. The mouth is very vascular, a lot of exchange going on. And so all of that's going to be carried away unless that patient has a compromised immune system. Maybe they've just um, completed chemotherapy or uh, FIV positive cats um, are another example. So if we've got immunocompromised, we're going to dispense post-op antibiotics in those cases. 
Convenia specifically is not the most effective uh, antibiotic for the oral cavity. It's just a different uh, group of bacteria that um, Convenia just doesn't cover. And so we're going to use things like clindamycin or clavamox. Those are our two um, top antibiotics that we will use if needed based on specific criteria. Um, how do you approach doctors uh, doing dental procedures earlier um, and they're still staging it by gross examination? And that's, that's a, a majority and that's a big paradigm shift that we're trying to get rolling and it's, it's going to be a slow paradigm shift, um, but it absolutely needs to happen. And um, this video by Dr. Beckman um, will kind of illustrate that and we'll talk about it a little bit. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board certified veterinary dentist and I'd like to share with you a misconception that many pet parents have and unfortunately some veterinarians have as well that gingivitis and calculus alone if it's mild is not going to be a significant problem especially for patients that are young patients in small breed dogs. 18 months of age is not uncommon for significant problems to start to occur in small breed patients, generally under 15 pounds. So if you have a small breed dog that falls into that category, <clears throat> pay particular attention please to these next four slides that I'm going to review that show a patient that has virtually no disease grossly just by looking but has significant disease under the gum line. This is actually a patient that came into my general practice years ago. This was not a dentistry procedure that we had planned because everything looked absolutely fantastic as you see here. But we had the patient under anesthesia for another procedure and we used that little periodontal probe to check for changes under the gum. We determined that there may be some problems, so we took x-rays, and this is what the x-ray looks like. All of that black or dark gray area around that back tooth root in the center of the picture where bone loss is present, and that is not just a void in the bone. If we look further, that's full of tissue that's infected and inflamed, and that's what you see in this image is all of that red inflamed and infected tissue surrounding the tooth root and laying up against the bone and progressively destroying the bone. This tooth is definitely one that we would want to extract. And you can see from this image after we clean that out how severe that actually is. So if you have a, especially have a small breed dog that falls into that category that's young, that's never had dental x-rays, now is the time to ask your veterinarian for that service. If they cannot provide that, certainly a board certified dentist near you can do so and make sure that this is not a problem for your pet and make sure that we keep your pet as happy and healthy as we can by keeping that oral cavity clean and disease free for the rest of its life. Thank you. So with those patients that are young, not showing any pathology, um, it is, um, it can be challenging to, to say, hey, we need to, you know, get this patient in for the first uh, cleaning and assessment. Again, it's all about education, that it's not about the cleaning. It's about assessing and identifying these patients early in their life rather than later where we still have a chance to intervene. If we find pathology early, uh, we can, number one, treat it, hopefully stop or stall the progression, eventually leading to extraction, and prevent that. And knowing that we've identified this patient early on in their life, that's going to change our protocols for the rest of that patient's life. Instead of letting them go a whole year, um, this patient, we would let go no longer than six months. And we're going to want to talk about really aggressive home care and making sure that we're minimizing plaque and tartar, minimizing inflammation. Those two um, 
big components that contribute to uh, tissue destruction, bone destruction uh, associated with periodontal disease. So <clears throat> whenever we talk about, uh, again, recommendations, I relate it to ourselves. When do we typically take our children to the dentist? Do we take them when they're four, five, six, seven years of age? A one-year-old dog in dog years is, or in people years, is seven years, okay? A three-year-old dog, a four-year-old dog, now we're in our 20s, and periodontal disease starts early. We know that. The earlier we catch it, the better. And so these dogs that are coming in, yeah, they're still considered babies, but in people years, um, you know, we're in that four or five or six year range. So we want to make sure that we're kind of explaining that. And periodontal disease in people is exactly the same process in our canine and feline patients. So it's really important that we find it early um, and treat appropriately to hopefully avoid extractions down the road. That's why it's not uncommon. We're seeing these smaller breed dogs at the age of four, five, six, seven years of age, and we're doing nothing but extractions. If we would have caught it earlier, we could have hopefully prevented that um, by um, changing um, how that patient is treated throughout its life with regards to dental care. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash INV.